Welcome to Taking Stock. Last week, in a world of Parliament and Government, it was Budget Day. The present Chancellor of the Exchequer stood outside number 11 Downing Street, lifted his battered red dispatch box to all four corners of the compass for the benefit of the press photographers and TV cameras, and then walked all the way to his waiting limousine, which took precisely one minute, 30 seconds to whisk him down Whitehall. A Whitehall carefully swept clean of traffic to the House of Commons, where he delivered a speech to the gathered few, which was the first time the contents of the budget were revealed. Uh, except, of course, spoiler alert, because it wasn't. Because choice selections of portions of the budget provisions had been judiciously and unattributedly leaked over the course of the previous couple of weeks. Mostly to government shills in selected right-wing news outlets. Just to tantalise and prepare the public for what was to come. So by the time the Chancellor rose to his feet, most of what he was about to say was already set in ten point times New Roman and sitting on the electronic galleys of what used to be proper newspapers in what used to be Fleet Street. Oh, and um, he doesn't live at 11 Downing Street, I hate to spoil the illusion, despite the impression they try to give. When he's in London, he lives in number 10, because the flat above number 11 is bigger. So Boris Johnson pulled rank on his apparent colleague and decided to have that for himself. Not that it matters, because in reality they're all connected as one complex. I think they got that idea from the Beatles film Help, but maybe not. And let's not run away with the idea that the red box contains anything other than the notes of whatever bunch of excuses masquerading as a speech he's concocted for a gaslit public. He didn't work out the budget himself, poring over the country's bank statements and spreadsheets long into the night by the light of a solitary candle like a character in some Dickens novel. The closest he might actually have got to that would have been when he channeled Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek and commanded his first officer in the Treasury to make it so. And he might as well have held up his iPad and waved that around for the benefit of the Fourth Estate, for all that it means anything at all, because it's all for appearances. I mean, any normal person going from Downing Street to Parliament would walk, not give the thoroughly bad example of jumping in a gas-guzzling limo for the journey. Oh, well, I say normal, of course. I'm thinking in terms of, I don't know, say the Sovereign of Denmark, who in various incarnations has been seen to cycle or walk around Copenhagen, just like any other Dane. That kind of normal. But like everything else to do with national government, it's not normal. The government knows what it's going to present to Parliament. And it knows that, regardless of the vociferous criticism of Her Majesty's loyal opposition, what the government presents will become the reality for us all. Whether it's corporation tax cuts and more austerity or largesse, there's a fair and all shall have prizes. It's all for show. When Tim Rice wrote the lyrics for Evita and started one song from his version of Che Guevara with the words, oh what a circus, oh what a show, in relation to the political scene, he wasn't being poetic, he was being realistic. And I'm sure 40 years later, that we still all recognise what a sham so much of our political scene has become over succeeding generations. The only object of political life, it seems to me, throughout the world, including this country, is the acquisition and retention of power. And not the acquisition and, 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 uh, of power in order to affect changes which are of benefit to all the people of this country. You know, to protect the vulnerable, enhance the lives of the poorest amongst us, and enrich the quality of life for all our citizens. All, all that good stuff. No, none of that. It's the retention of power for the sake of power itself. And for the benefit of the powerful. And no one else. Now, you may wish to suggest that this sounds a bit political in itself. And so it is, but it isn't party political. Criticism of those in power extends not only to those at this moment in government, but also to those who aspire to government. And that criticism is the proper function, or one of the proper functions of God-centred faith and of people of faith and faith leaders. For we ought to hold no allegiance, none, whatever, more sacred than our allegiance to the outworking of faith in the life of the world and the application of Christian principles, both as laid out in the Bible and as revealed to us by the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives both of faithful people 
and of those seeking faith while walking a rocky modern road. It is in effect our job to criticise and call to account those who have been placed in authority over us by virtue of accruing the most votes in an antiquated system in desperate need of reform. It's our job to hold up to the scrutiny the policies of any government and to apply to them the acid test of the gospel of Christ and unhesitatingly to oppose those which manifestly do not reflect that gospel. So, for example, we should be prepared to say out loud that we, in, that we opposed the inhuman policies of the Trump administration in the United States with regard to refugees and economic migrants on its southern border. We should have been unafraid, though sad, at needing to criticise the government of Myanmar and the Aung San Suu Kyi for its treatment of the Rohingya Muslim people. And we should be forthright in our condemnation of the emerging prosecution, persecution and potential genocidal behaviour of the Chinese government in its systemic oppression and persecution of the Ouija people of Western China. In light of biblical precedents, precedents we highlight in our lectionary lessons around Easter, when Jesus, in the heart of the Jewish faith tradition, the temple, challenged those in power in many ways, we are surely also, therefore, religiously and morally obliged to expose and denigrate hypocrisy and callousness when those traits are so blatant in our own government. Which is why, along with the terrible treatment of refugees in the United States, the persecution of the Rohingyas by the Burmese, and the oppression of the Ouijas by the Chinese, we need to hold up a mirror to our own government's social, moral and political failings and support of human rights abusers. Which is the only way one can describe our government's policy of selling arms to regimes in the Middle East which already possessed of documented human rights abuses, we know will go on to be used against defenceless adults and children in the Yemen. And we need to declare that it's grossly immoral. There are, no, there are literally no excuses which justify that trade. A whole industry is not worth saving if by doing so it costs the life of a single Yemeni child. No amount of whataboutery, but, but if we don't sell arms, someone else will, can possibly excuse the moral corruption involved in developing the second biggest arms industry in the world, whose products are used always and only to kill. And as churches, we should expect to risk opprobrium in making such statements. We should be prepared to go against the perceived wisdom, to kick against what is considered acceptable or even normal according to received opinions in political terms. An aspect of salvation we seldom speak of, but which really ought to be a given, is honesty before God and before our brothers and sisters, and justice and protection for those who are most vulnerable. And it isn't honest if, by our silence, we give, acute, uh, we give assumed consent and approval to any and all who happen at this moment to hold the leaves of power, no matter who they are, for fear of committing the great sin of being political. For decades, possibly centuries, Christians in Britain have been fed the lie that to be political to adopt an, unap an unapologetic and in some senses unaccommodating stance is somehow unchristian and unacceptable. And that's manifestly false. And if we continue to believe that, then we only go to prove that people of faith are being gaslighted by those in power. Not only is it not disloyal, un-British or irreligious in any way to admit to being political with a lowercase p, it is in fact a thoroughly patriotic act of faith to hold those people to account especially when they manifestly fail to uphold the moral and social teachings of every faith worth having. When those in power hold the poorest and most vulnerable in the world in contempt, then that is an act of such deep sacrilege that, that it can only be answered by a unity of social, moral and political opposition, that it renders that opposition not just a religious duty, but a sacramental act. Stay safe, people.